Hey, welcome everybody to All About the Game podcast. Uh, my name is Todd Blylev, and I'm here with my co-host, Dave Majeski, Mike Micucci, and welcoming us today, my dad, Bert Blylevin. Hi. Thanks for being on, Dad. Uh, <laughs> really cool. This is our first podcast with uh, four of us, which is kind of neat. So hopefully we don't break the system or or uh, scare people too much with all of our mugs. But, um, you know, Dad, uh, talking about you as a player, I mean, we've talked a lot about that in previous podcasts. You were able to, you know, with Mike and I, talk about your breaking ball and, and your mentality on pitching, which was really cool. Today, I thought we could talk about uh, what you learned, uh, what you didn't know as an announcer, and going in from the playing, the, you know, being in the major leagues and obviously, you know, getting into the hall of fame, which is amazing. And then going into announcing though, through that journey and what you've learned, thought we could share some funny stories that you, you know, maybe had some mishaps. Uh, obviously there's some that are pretty recognizable, which are kind of funny to talk about uh, now because it's over, but uh, what were some of the things, you know, where, where did you start the announcing? How did that come about? Um, I mean, you got done playing. I know, you know, you had a restaurant and uh, you did some other things, but where did the announcing come in? Well, you know, I still, I love the game. I, you know, I played it for so long as a pitcher, but I think guys that uh, the thing that uh, I missed it, I missed being around the game and growing up in Southern California, of course, I was a big angel fan. I played for the angels. That's where I ended my career. I kind of followed them and I would watch the ball games on TV and, uh, I had an opportunity to do a couple of college games up in Washington. Uh, I worked with Steve Fiziak, did a couple of college games. And then the Minnesota Twins uh, president uh, at the time, Dave St. Peter, heard that I was doing some broadcasting and the Twins were coming in to play the Angels. So he asked me if I'd be interested in doing the three games. And I said, sure, I'll, I'll, I'll try it. Uh, didn't do a lot of homework. I knew the players. I knew the angels. I had just left them a couple of years before. So I went up into the booth and had fun with it. And uh, it was funny. The third game of the series, uh, I think what uh, got me more gigs was the uh, uh, Dick Bramer. I worked with Dick Bramer for 25 years. But uh, after the third ball game, you know, we we're saying our goodbyes. And he said, I enjoyed working with you, Big Bert. And I said, well, thank you, Big Dick. And uh, I think that uh, that kind of, you know, set the stage. Hey, you want to do some more games? You know, you're having fun up there. And so, you know, I did. And then uh, the, the following year, they offered me half the games. Tommy John was doing most of the games at that time. Of course, the, the great left-handed pitcher, a guy that should be in the Hall of Fame, was doing twin games. And he didn't really have twin tiding uh, with him, you know, so. They offered me half the games. I did that. And then a year later, they offered me all the games to do and ended up moving up to Minnesota with Tim and Tom. And, and uh, you know, we, we kind of made that home. So I, I think the biggest thing, Todd, you asked the question about, you know, going from, say, the field to the booth, it's doing your homework. Uh, no matter what you guys do or what we do in life, you have to do your homework. And uh, that's what I enjoyed doing. I love the pitcher catcher relationship. So that was always something for, you know, 23 years on the mound, your relationship with that pitcher catcher, but up in a booth, it looks easy down on the field. It's a tough game. And uh, I think I tried to bring that how hard it is. Guy's going to make an error. You know, you can't let that, you can't show up the umpire. You can't show up your teammates. Got to be a good teammate. You got to have fun playing the game. And if you do that, then, good things will happen i think in the organization guys no matter what you do you know what we do in life you got to have fun playing the game or doing whatever you do you want to get up monday morning go to work enjoy it you know if it's a if, if it's a drag maybe you want to do something else Bert, you mentioned a couple of times like doing your homework could you give us uh like some of the examples you're talking about when you're going up to the booth and getting ready for a series and some of the things maybe you didn't know those first three games when you were doing the angel twin game that you learned over the, over time that you can give the audience a little bit of insight to. Yeah. I always had index cards with me because, you know, I don't, I can't remember some guys, you know, can remember what they did 
you know, last week. I have a tough time remembering that. So every what I did is I made index cards, three by five index cards of every player that was on the Twins at the time since I was there doing 150 some games. Uh, and then when the opposing team came in, I did cards on them, where they're from, you know, what college did they sign out of high school? They come out of college. Where were they born? You know, how old are they? I think I'd always thought fans were interested in that just rather than sometimes, you know, it's a three, one count or this guy's coming up, you know, they want to know a little history about that player. And so I had cards of every player in, in, in the league that the twins were going to play. And it took a lot of work, you know, as soon as a ball game was over, I went back to my hotel room or back to room and got ready for the next day, especially this getting the starting pitcher, or the opposing pitcher and the lineup and who's hot, who's not. Mm -hmm. I think fans uh, wanted to hear that. Right. Was there anything, you know, after spending years in the dugout, years on the field, years in the bullpen, once you went up to the booth, was there anything about the game itself that shocked you that you didn't know before? You know what, Dave, it was something that if I wasn't pitching, I was kind of managing on the bench along with, you know, watch the game. I did wasn't a guy that went up to the clubhouse the day I wasn't pitching and hung out there. I watched the ball game. So you learn a lot. You watch your manager, how they go about, you know, is this a hit and run situation, man, on first to second in the seventh inning, and you're down a run. Do you bunt here or you try to, you know, get the two or three run inning, depending on the lineup, who you're facing, who they have in the bullpen, all that stuff, you know, comes into play uh, when you're not pitching. Now, when I'm on the mound, of course, you know, you're concentrating on every pitch because one pitch could cost you a win or a loss. And, uh, you know, it, it was just, I think, going up to the booth, it was fun because I already had watched it for 23 years. And now I get to actually feed off my play by play guy to analyze exactly what maybe is going on or maybe what the manager's thinking. So a lot of it comes into play. And if you love the game, I think, uh, you know, you're going to look at it and say, you know what, why didn't they do this? It's a great game to second guess. I, I think that's one thing I learned early. You know, why, why did he throw him this pitch, a fastball, 3-1, with a guy on third and one out? You know, you, first base is open, you know, all those things. But the thing is, you know, when I was on the mound, I made the same stupid mistakes, and I knew that <laughs> after the fact. Yeah. Uh, it's, like I said, it's, 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 to me, it's the greatest game in the world because every night is different. The mentality of the game, you can't, it's not, you know, it's not shooting baskets. It's not, you know, for one touchdown, be the final baseball is a nine inning game. You have to have patience with it. And hopefully, you know, it comes out at the end that uh, the team you're rooting for wins. Dad, when, when, uh, I mean, obviously there's so much knowledge in, in yourself and watching the game, playing the game for so long, being, being as successful and as such a bulldog as what you were on the mound and a student of the game in terms of the mechanics, when you were announcing the game and say you'd watch a pitcher, you know, throw a couple innings, maybe there were some mechanical things that you saw. How hard was that or how easy was that for you as an announcer opposed to same, some other announcers that didn't have your background? To go into the clubhouse the next day, you know, talk to that pitcher about what you saw. Did you want to? Did you want to do that? Did you not want to step on the pitching coach's toes? Like, how was that? You because you know, I know you probably wanted to just help, but there had to have been some lines that you had to stay in too. So, what was that like? Yeah, definitely, as as a broadcaster, you're a broadcaster. You're not a coach. You're not the pitching coach, but uh, you can see certain things. And I'm going to use one example. Jose Barrios came up about five six years ago with the twins and maybe late in the season. And he was pitching off the first base side of the pitching rubber, a right-handed pitcher pitching off the first base side of the pitching rubber. And this is what this, we could do a whole show on why guys are all of a sudden moved over on the rubber, but he's pitching on the first base side and he's missing his breaking ball. He's got a nice hard breaking ball, but the catcher's catching it about this far outside, almost consistently he was missing down and away. So 
I didn't say anything. You know, I, I the pitching coach, I, I, you don't want to step on any toes. Well, I ended up going on the winter caravan up in Minnesota in December for, for the twins, which I do every year. And Jose Barrios was on my leg. Uh, so we got a chance on the bus to talk. And I, that's the first thing I said to him. I said, Jose, you know, he's from Puerto Rico, really a great kid. I said, why are you on, why are you, as a right-handed pitcher, why are you on the first base side of the pitching rubber with your right foot? He said, I don't know. I said, well, why did you, I said, do me a favor. I said, to me, pitching is about geometry, planes and angles. Okay, if I move over on that two foot pitching rubber over to this side of the pitching rubber. Now, if I have to throw that ball down and away and Ted Williams has that hitting chart and I show all my Dutch pitchers that every pitch was down and away to Ted Williams, he would hit 230, 240, 250. Well, I always figured that I'd said three things on the mound when I pitched. Stay back, stay tall, work out front. Okay, now Jose Barrios is on the first base side of the pitching rubber, trying to hit that spot that Ted Williams said is so tough to hit to a right-handed hitter, okay? If the ball is straight, see my hand right there? It's straight. Okay, I move over 18 inches, watch. Now the ball comes at an angle down and away. That's the work part of pitching right there. And I said, all those breaking balls that you were missing this far, you move over this far, guess what? That pitch is down and away. Well, he did it. He's made two all-star teams and he, he does credit me on, on that, but sometimes it's the timing that you get an opportunity to talk to a pitcher. I, I, I would like to know, everybody wants to throw that ball down and away, but if you're over on the first base side as a right-handed pitcher, to a right-handed hitter, he's over here, I'm there. If I wanna throw that ball down and away, it's straight on this side. If I move over on the pitching rubber and throw it away, now that hitter sees the ball coming at it this way rather than that way. Simple, it's simple. But for some reason, the analytics of today in the game, you know, these pitchers are all pitching on, to me, the opposite side. We came up you know, Jim Perry, Jim Cott, you watch Gibson pitch, you watch Nolan Ryan pitch. We were all on the, the our strong side, our right side of the pitching rubber. Just something a little like that. But pitching is about uh, stay back, stay tall. Stay back, meaning stay over the rubber. Stay tall, meaning don't drive. Tom Seaver was a driver. Not too many guys could do what Tom Seaver did where he got so low in his delivery, and but he utilized his legs. Stay back, stay tall, work out front. Throw a good breaking ball, you got to be out front. To go good fastball down and away, you got to go that way. Simple, but it's hard. Lip, if, if everyone is, well, of course, not everyone, but if all, all these guys are on the first base side incorrectly, somebody must be teaching that to them. What do you think the benefit is or, or what is the perceived benefit for being on that first base side? You know what, Dave, I think one thing I would like to see baseball do, and they're not going to do it, is, is have people that had some major league experience go down to the minor leagues and teach these kids how to pitch. It's sad to say, and not taking anything away from coaches that went through the college level and all that stuff, but they are, guys aren't going to go down there for twenty, thirty thousand dollars $30,000 and spend a whole summer away from their family when they've been playing baseball for 15 years. But you pay these guys good. We'll go down and work with these kids, teach them the, the art of pitching. Now it's just the art of throwing. That's what I see right here in Fort Myers, Florida. When I, when I go down and watch these kids pitch, they have no clue. Even though they came out of college or high school, you know, all they're trying to do is throw 95 miles an hour. I worked with a left-hander the other day, a left-handed kid that's going to a double A school in Alabama, uh, for about three or four times on the mound and I moved him over. He was over on, you know, as a left-handed pitcher on the third base side, I moved him over all of a sudden that angle came for him. He's got a nice delivery. He's not overpowering, maybe top out at 87, 88. And now I haven't seen him at his best because he's just going to college and he was, wasn't throwing them, but he had good control. He had a good smooth delivery. Now let's keep him there to, he doesn't have to throw 95 to get a guy out. Ask Greg Maddox. Ask, you know, ask Tom Glavin. You know, those guys, they were pitchers. 
And uh, I, I think, you know, when you come out of college or high school, these, these coaches down there, all I want to see is velocity. Well, Nolan okay. Ryan threw, you know, 95 to 100 night after night for nine, 10 innings, whatever he did. But if you left a fastball there that was straight, he was going to get beat. You got to hit your spots. I think they that's to one year, to your point, I think that's kind of a byproduct of what the, you know, baseball executives are rewarding. You know, every guy that gets called up, you know, is a flamethrower, but that's all they are is throwers. And they're not real pitchers. And I believe Jordan Zimmerman made a comment a few months ago about how the executives, you know, and the GMs bring these guys up and they have no idea how to pitch. And you're really putting hitters in danger because they're just throwers and they pull them up and they hit somebody in the head or, you know, have no command of any of their pitches and their fastball and they're throwing 99 miles an hour. And then, you know, somebody gets hit and then they find out they can't throw strikes and they just send them back down. They call somebody else up. Well, you know, I'm still with the twins. I'm employed by the twins as a special assistant. And, you know, I watched the ball games. I think the twins have probably gone through 25 different relievers. <laughs> it seems like, you know, every time I turn TV on, your starter goes four or five innings and boy, he did a great job. You know, he kept us in the game four or five innings. And now here, co here comes three, four, five guys to try to close the ball game. And all they're doing is throwing hard. And, you know, they have one bad outing, boom, they're back at triple A. And the, it's a teeter totter type of thing right now that, we didn't see, I think, five, 10 years ago. Now you just see, I mean, just it's arm after arm after arm, but it's the guys that know how to pitch will stay there. It's mm -hmm. just that merry-go-round right now is too hectic. Hey, Todd, some of that goes back to our conversation about scouting and maybe ego or protecting your job, where you know, if you as the scout are writing up somebody that's throwing 95, even if he has no clue, if your name is on it, is on him as the scout and he craps out, your owner, your GM is going to say, well, okay, Todd, I get it. He's throwing 95. Whereas if you put your name on some guy that can really pitch, but he's only throwing 84, 85, if he craps out, now people are going to second guess the scout that sent him up just because he doesn't have that power analytic. Would you agree with that? Yeah, you know, I mean, back when I was scouting, now this was about 10 years ago, analytics weren't as prevalent as what they are now. So you could put yourself out on the line and talk about more about the pitchability of a player. Steven Andrade, a senior sign out of Cal State Stanislaw, was a kid that I had seen multiple times. He had an offset finger uh, deal, and he could throw that two seam just a kid that I felt could get bigger and stronger and better even in the minor league system. And he ends up pitching for the angels and the Royals as their closer for a couple of years. Um, those are guys that you could talk about pitchability with. He didn't have all the overpowering stuff. He's at a, a whatever Cal State Stanless is division wise uh, back in the day. But then you got a kid, Kevin Jepson, you know, another kid that ended up learning, I think at the big league level, like my dad was just talking about, where you learn at that big league level, but he was a 98 mile an hour guy in high school. Now there's so much focus on this 95, 98, kids are blowing out after their second year, their arms aren't mature enough to be able to throw that. And like you just said, dad, there's no pitch ability. I mean, Mike, when you were managing for all those years and especially recently, how did you see that evolve over the, over the last you know, five years where the organization was, you probably got influenced a lot to move guys. Well, guys yeah, in. there is a couple, a couple different points going back to what Dave had talked about. I mean, just sitting in um, meetings, pre-draft meetings or scouting meetings, um, getting ready for the draft at times as the player development guy and listening to the scouts. If you didn't turn in somebody that was throwing 95 miles an hour, even before the draft, you were getting kind of reprimanded so to speak like how could you possibly not turn this guy in he's 95 miles an hour before they even knew like if the guy could pitch or had pitch ability or it's just 95 you almost you had to you know so then you started that and then i mean as a manager i always looked at um how our guys use their stuff and you know at the minor league level could they get you know there was a difference between command and control 
You know, control was just the ability to throw strikes. Command was the ability to put the ball really where you wanted to put it. So if I wanted to come inside, you know, did I have the ability to throw the ball in or just miss in? Um, or if I'm trying to miss, you know, that would be command. Whereas control is when I'm throwing the ball, I'm, you know, setting up inside and all of a sudden the guy yanks it outside and throws a strike, you know, and then he has control because he throws a lot of strikes, but he doesn't exactly have command. So that was one thing that we, I always would try and look for, but then just, you know, from a, a managing standpoint, you know, evaluating the, the, the starters as how, how many, could they get swings and misses? on stuff that was in the strike zone, you know, instead of just relying on, you know, hitters chasing, because eventually as you move up, they're not going to chase as much. The, the ability to get a swing and miss in the strike zone, you know, the ability to get underneath the barrel and to get above the barrel and not work east and west so much. Like I think these kids coming out of college and we would see it a lot and coming out of high school are always trying to run the ball off the end of the bat. And everything is always just trying to go sideways, east to west, and just running it off the end of the bat and working the other batter's box. And the ability to get a, a swing and miss or something underneath the barrel that doesn't hit the dirt was really important as, as far as what I was looking for. And then just as a catcher, understanding a little bit about mechanics and knowing when they were getting tired without the pitch count and just watching their delivery start to break down a little bit meant more to me, you know, stressful innings and stressful pitches versus non-stressful ones. Uh, we looked at pitches per inning was something that I paid attention to, but yeah, even at that time, it was when I started out, generally you had a couple guys that were prospects that you would put towards the back end of the bullpen. Um, and it was really, they had a decent breaking ball um, and some command with their fastball. And then that started to turn into you know, just throwers, this guy's throwing 95 and you were just hoping to get swings and misses and chases. You're really starting to hope that you're getting chases instead of knowing what you're going to get when the guy comes out of the pen. Hey, Mike, is that, is that why organizations, you say that, you know, if you didn't have your name on the guy that throws 95, you want that kid in the organization, maybe because you're hoping, okay, he's got the velocity. Hopefully something is there that he can now learn how to pitch in time. Well, I think they, they, we used to talk about it a lot, you know, look at a couple of the flaws, but he throws 95, we can fix the mechanics. And all of a sudden now we got something, um, which is what we are always kind of hoping for, you know, is to be able to teach him how to really be pitchers. But again, going back to that, when they first come in, I remember early in my managing career, um, just listening to some of these kids coming out of some of these major schools and like wanting the catcher. You talked earlier about the pitcher catcher relationship, but wanting the catcher to set up off the plate, like early in the count. Oh, oh. And I'm like, well, no, 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 no. He needs to stay on the plate. You got to throw the ball over the plate. And he's like, oh, we never threw the ball over the plate in college. I'm like, well, you got to throw it over the plate here. You know, at some point you can't just throw the ball off the, off the edges constantly, you know, and we, we all know the importance of strike one, you know, and you know, the difference in the batting average in an Oh one count versus a one Oh count, you know, and the importance of getting ahead, but yeah, that relationship of the catcher sitting in a certain spot on the plate to get the best stuff out of the pitcher's breaking ball out of his fastball where, you know, the vision that it, the pitcher likes to see uh, where he needs to sit to get that ball to do what really what you want it to do. You know, I was very fortunate. I came up at 19 years old, but I got to watch Jim Perry win the Cy Young in 1970 when he won 24 ball games. Well, the fastball was probably maybe 91, 92, excellent control. You pick the brains of those guys. Jim Cott, same thing. You know, when I came back to Minnesota, Frank Viola won a great changeup. Brad Radke. These, I'm not. I'm talking about guys that aren't throwing 95 to 97 miles an hour. Guys that learned how to pitch. Johan Santana, you know, won two Cy Young awards in a Twins uniform because he learned how to pitch with that not only good fastball but the great changeup, you back and forth. So yeah, that, that's what you want out of your youngster. That no matter if you're 12 years old and kids, don't throw that curveball over and over and over at 12. 12, 10, 12 years old. You know what? 
wait till you're 13, let that arm develop a little bit, you know, get strong, learn the fastball, learn control of the fastball, learn to change up, change up probably the best pitch in baseball. If you can control your fastball, find a spot and just hit down and away. My best conversation ever talking to Don Drysdale, not only the importance of working away, but also working inside, establish yourself inside. And when I came up, we had a catcher, Phil Roof, that came over from the Brewers in 1971. And he became my mentor, like you're talking, Mike, about, you know, how catchers can help. Phil, oh, my goodness, if I didn't throw the pitch he wanted, he was a big, strong guy. He had double the hand, my hand size. He would throw that ball right by my shin and point that big old finger at me. Let's go. Concentrate. Get that ball where I want it. That's the relationship that, that I love watching when, even up in the booth, the pitcher catcher relationship. Yeah. Amazing stuff. Guys, uh, this was an incredible show. We've um, we're touching on a lot of really cool topics here that I'd almost like to kind of segment off uh, over the course of time. And, and uh, dad, we would love to have you on as much as you're wanting to and able to. Hey, uh, I'm retired. I have nothing to do other than play golf. <laughs> That's awesome. Uh, but, you know, really enjoyed you sharing some stories about, you know, uh, being an announcer, what it goes and what goes into that. Uh, Dave, I'll, I want to learn more, you know, in this next episode, more about, you know, the college coach mentality. I mean, you've listened to, kind of the Mike and the pro side and the manager and my dad and the announcer. And I've certainly talked about the scouting. I think it'd be really interesting to learn more about that day-to-day -day, uh, college coach uh, responsibility and roles, you know, from the recruiting side to the playing and keeping all those athletes moving. I mean, there's so many different parts to it, but. Uh, it, I would love to, and I will, but probably like our audience, no one wants to hear me. We, we just want to sit and hear Burp Lyleven stories all day. <laughs> I want to hear you. I want to hear you, Dave. Yeah. I, well, I think that's intriguing, though, really. I mean, yeah. you think about it because, you know, in the big leagues, you have a manager and you have in spring training. I'm part of the, the spring training uh, pitching side now. You have seven, eight, nine guys out there. Can there be too many things Dave, going through a kid's mind when all of a sudden, you know, in a college, you have one or two coaches maybe with you and you get a chance to focus somebody individually. In the big leagues, you're getting your ear full because one guy's going to tell you one thing, another guy's going to tell you another. That's tough. That's tough. And add in, add in mom and dad who are right in your ear as well. That's true. <laughs> yeah. All right, guys. Great third episode uh dad thanks again for joining us uh you're part of the crew now so well, i love you buddy thanks for all right everybody be safe be well enjoy your day and uh we'll talk at you next week thanks Good. a lot. God bless. god bless scout hubs organization evaluation software contains an event registration platform easy to use event evaluation sheets for your coaches and provides each athlete with a post event online player page containing their event evaluation. Organizations can even add the athletes analytical or athletic performance metrics captured from great brands like Pocket Radar, Blast Motion and others too. The evaluation software is easy to use and provides you with post event metrics and player data you can use for future player development camps and tracking the progress of each attendee. The athlete's state of the art online player page contains their evaluation from the event, a player bio section where they can add their highlight videos, photo and more, giving them a great exposure tool, showcasing their playing ability. Each time their game is evaluated by any team or coach using the Scout Hub's evaluation software, their evaluations stack up over time, giving each athlete the opportunity to track their progress and view the documented feedback, helping each athlete get better. Provide your athletes with a post-event evaluation. Increase your retention rates and your income. Track and manage your athlete's progression. Add value to your athlete's experience and separate from your competition today. Check out the organizational evaluations page on the website and start advancing your game today.